from my phone to flip. As always, hello, Facebook audience. And there's my Periscope audience. How y'all doing? Uh, welcome this afternoon. I know that I am a half hour earlier. The reason that I'm a half hour earlier is because I forgot that I had a meeting today. And so I'm going to have to uh, just change the timetable. That's just for today. So if you miss me live because you're tuning in at 2.30 and you see I've already done my broadcast, I apologize. Um, I meant to meant to uh, let people know I just forgot because I have uh, uh, a meeting and stuff I have to go to today. So anyway, so I'm just coming on early. So the video will be there. So even though if you miss me live because I, I normally come on at 2.30, I'm coming on at 2 o'clock. PM Central Standard Time. So if you miss me live, then just, you know, you can watch the replay. Okay? So, what's my tagline? My tagline is that God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets. Okay? I'm going to say that one more time. God already told you what was going to happen. Okay? If you had just listened to the prophets. Now, if you want to support me, there are links. On my Periscope profile, there's my PayPal link, and on my Facebook Live page with every video, there's a link for PayPal Me, Prophet David Taylor, and also Amazon Smile. Amazon Smile has a portal to where when you buy things off of Amazon, you can choose a not-for-profit, and they will send a portion of their portion of the payment to the not-for-profit if you'd like to support me that way. And then uh, I'm setting things up for you to get my music. I know I've been talking about my music for a long time. But it's taken me a while to get some stuff set up. But uh, if you can want to support me that way, you can buy my music from iTunes, you know, stream it and listen to it and then watch my videos. OK, so I'm going to be porting all that over to this page, my Prophet David Taylor page. So you can have my prophetic weekly ministry on Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, most Sundays, just 2 o'clock today. Uh, no More Genies, my monthly teaching, second Thursday night. And then my prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross music. I have lots of different kinds of music ministry that I want to be able to share with, uh, with this audience as well. Okay? The easiest way to find me online, I just told you when I'm on, prophetically ministering. Sundays, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, except under special circumstances. Thursday, second Thursday of every night, every month, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time with my No More Genies series. And then I'm going to establish something new for the music. The quickest way to find me online is to use hashtag PDT. PDT for Prophet David Taylor. Hashtag PDT. That's the easiest way to find me. Because I hashtag everything I do with that hashtag. Okay? All right, so let's jump into the lesson because I will be done by 2.30 today. Uh, the word for the day, the prophetic word for today is new start. New start. New start. Now, I feel the Spirit of God pressing me to release a prophetic word. Then we're going to look at a scripture, and then we're going to expound on that, both the prophetic word and the scripture, okay? For behold, my people, I have called you to... A new start and a new beginning. I have called you to forget those things which are behind. I have called you to forgiveness for self. Forgiveness of yourself. I have called you to claim my shed blood as payment for your sin and your wrongs. And move forward to take the promised land and live the dreams I have promised you. Under the guise of my name, my blood, my banner, my grace, and my lordship. So harden not your heart and do not delay, but move forward and take the promised land says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen, amen. Okay? So our scripture reference for today is Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Philippians is in the New Testament. Philippians is one of those things that we call an epistle. An epistle is a fancy word that means letter. And uh, it's also what we call a Pauline epistle, which also means that it was written by the Apostle Paul. Now, the vast majority of Paul's writings in the New Testament is him writing to churches, either churches he's established or churches he's visited or churches he's established and then turned over to a permanent pastor or congregations that, congregations that he's visited, that he's ministered to, 
that then had questions on what it meant to be a Christian, because you have to understand that in Paul's day, the idea of justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ was completely radical. It was completely radical. The idea for the Jews, for the Hebrews, that they didn't have to keep the Mosaic law, and the idea for Gentiles that you could be justified before the true and living God through no effort of your own, that Jesus Christ, through his brutal beating, his stripes and his beating and his whippings and the spitting and the scourgings, and then his nailing to the cross, his six-hour death on the cross, and the crown of thorns on his head with the blood coming down into his eyes and the nail prints in his hands and the nail print in his side and the nail prints in his feet, that by his brutal death and by the shedding of his blood and by his six-hour death on the cross, and then three days later, by his powerful resurrection, from the grave. It was news to Gentiles, and Gentiles are people that are not Jews. So anybody that uh, is not a natural, physical seed of Abraham is what is called a Gentile in the Bible. That just means you're not a Jew, okay? So for the Gentiles, the people that were not Jews, the idea that <clears throat> you could be justified before God because of what Jesus did and the price he paid on the cross, and it wasn't through any effort or work of your own, was radical. So this is the crux, this is the heart of everything that Paul writes about. Paul's assignment from Christ was explaining the new covenant that Jesus died and shed his blood to establish. The old covenant was gone, that was news to the Hebrews, and the new covenant was now in place, the, the doctrine of salvation the saving of the soul before God by grace through faith because of what Christ did uh, by his arrest, his beating, his crucifixion, and his resurrection on the third day. Okay? So with that in mind, we're reading Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. This is a Pauline epistle that Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, city called Philippi. That's why it's called Philippians. Okay? Philippians 3.13. Out of the King James, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Out of the NIV, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Okay? Okay, the Berean Literal Bible. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing indeed, forgetting the things behind and reaching forward to the things ahead. What does all that mean in the context of the prophetic word that the Holy Ghost gave us today? What that means is that Paul is saying that he realizes he's not yet everything that Christ wants him to be. Raise your hand if that's true for you. If you know that where you are in your life right now is you're not quite yet everything that Christ wants you to be. So Paul is saying, Paul is saying that he's not saying that he's arrived. <clears throat> and let me throw in while I'm here, you got to be careful around those Christians that talk like they've arrived. That talk like what they know about God is all there is to know. <laughs> That's not true. And that what they've experienced is all there is to experience. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people who don't have experience with the prophetic say that they don't believe in the prophetic or the prophetic isn't real or the big one is that the prophetic isn't for today. None of that is true because the whole Bible is prophetic. <laughs> okay? So, or when people say there aren't any more apostles. No. There was only one set of the twelve the 12 that walked with Jesus, and then Judas fell, and he got replaced. They cast lots and got Matthias, but some say that Jesus' pick was Paul. But either way, there was only one set of the 12, but they weren't the only apostles, okay? And so on and on and on, over the course of my life, I've heard people say that because they haven't had certain experiences or because they don't understand certain passages of Scripture, or just because they don't like a certain truth, that it can't be true. Mm -mm. 
That's incorrect. No one person can have every experience that's in the Bible. Did you ever think about that? You can't have all the experiences. Nobody in the Bible had all the experiences. Okay? No one person can have all the experiences. So Paul says, I don't consider myself to have arrived. So in other words, Paul is saying, I know I'm not yet everything that Christ wants me to be. Okay? That's what it means. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. What's it? Perfection. What's it? Uh, being fully finished. What's it? Uh, everything that God wants you to be. That's what he means when he's talking about taking hold of it. But he says, but one thing I do. Now, let me stop right there. <clears throat> one of the things that I've begun to study is secrets of people that were successful in the Bible uh, in their walk with God. Now, notice I said successful and not mistake free because there are no people, <laughs> there are no humans in the Bible and otherwise that are mistake free. The only human that ever lived that was mistake free was Christ himself. Everybody in the Bible had made mistakes and everybody that's a Christian makes mistakes. They just don't make the same kind of mistakes. And often they don't make the same mistakes at the same point in life because King Solomon waited till he was old to start acting a fool, okay? But anyway, so, uh, so I started studying people that were successful, and I noticed that there's a pattern. With every person in the Bible that did what God wanted them to do, they had a singularity. They either had singleness of heart, or singleness of mind, or singleness of commitment, or all three. Like Joseph. Joseph was committed to his integrity. Like Job, Job had a singular commitment to his integrity. Job said, I will not compromise my integrity towards God, even if God kills me. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Daniel had a singular commitment to his integrity. Daniel said, I'm not going to compromise on how I serve my God. Even if y'all pass laws that get me in trouble and throw me in the lion's den, I'm still not going to compromise his integrity. So he had a singular commitment to his integrity. King David had single-heartedness. King David loved the Lord his God, and he didn't love any other gods. There were many times under the Old Covenant, you see the Hebrews going up and down, because sometimes they served God, and sometimes they served Baal, and sometimes they served Jehovah, and sometimes they served Ashtoreth, or Moloch, or Dagon. Okay, they went in and out. But King David had a single heart towards God. He had a singleness of heart. Okay, and he loved God and he never loved any other God in his life. He let his flesh get out of control a lot, but he never gave his love to another God other than the, the true and living God of heaven. Apostle Paul, you know what Apostle Paul's secret was? He had singleness of mind, man. Apostle Paul was focused. Once Paul, then Saul of Tarsus, once he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, when Jesus blinded him. Once Paul got saved, once he got converted, he never looked back. Paul went so hard after Christ, and at the end of his life, right before he was beheaded, because Paul was martyred, right before he was beheaded, he said his famous line, his famous words, I fought a good fight, I have finished my course. There it is. Paul said, I did what I was supposed to do with my life. And he said, I have kept the faith. He said, therefore, there is laid up for me, henceforth, a crown of righteousness. Okay? So Paul, in other words, was saying, I'm anticipating my reward in heaven because I did what, I, what the Lord wanted me to do with my life. And the reason Paul was able to do that, because Paul went through some stuff, boy, and the Lord told him when he got saved, he was going to go through some stuff. Paul was going to suffer a lot for the cause of Christ, and he did. Paul had to fast a lot. Paul had to spend a lot of time without food. Paul was beaten. Paul was arrested. Paul was in ships that wrecked. They beat Paul so badly. One time they left him for dead. One time he was warming his hands over a fire and a snake jumped out the fire and fastened himself on Paul's hand and stung him with that venom and everybody thought Paul was going to die. I mean, Paul went through a lot. So how do you account for Paul's success? How did Paul make it to the end of his journey and then be able to say, I fought a good fight to finish the course because he had singleness of mind. That's how. Okay? He had singleness of mind. So I've discovered that the people that were successful in their walk with God, in spite of extreme, oh, 
Jesus went through extreme stuff. Joseph went through extreme stuff. Job. Job went through extreme stuff. Daniel. Daniel went through extreme stuff. Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul went through extreme stuff. How did they make it? They make it because they had a they made it because they had a singularity. They had singleness of heart, or they had a singular commitment to integrity, or a singular commitment, or singleness of mind, or all three. Heart, commitment, and mind. Okay? So why did I say that here? I said that because Paul said, but one thing I do. Why is that so important? Because when somebody that is that successful gives you their foundational principle, that means it would be wise to emulate it. So in other words, let's follow Paul's example. If Paul was able to do that, and he says, there ain't but one thing I do to make all that happen. Wow. Okay. Well, if there's a one thing, a single thing that you do, and you made it all the way to the end, then let me adopt that thing into my life. And then Paul says, forgetting what is behind, good gravy from the Navy, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. King James, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. Uh, Berean literal, forgetting those things behind and reaching forward to the things ahead. Uh, Berean study Bible, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. So Paul just gave us his secret. If Apostle Paul that wrote the vast majority of the New Testament, before he was Saul of Tarsus, he was an avowed Christian killer. Paul was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So in other words, Paul kept the Mosaic law better than anybody. And then he met the Lord and realized that all that didn't count. <laughs> so Paul said what he does, part one, is he forgets what is behind. Why is that so important? Because so many times we will not forgive ourselves for our sins and mistakes past. So many times we are still carrying the burden of the guilt and the shame of the wrong that we did. And we, and we carry it forward, you know, over and over and over and over again. And you replay that tape, you replay that video over and over and over and over again in your mind of the mistakes that you made. Okay? And Paul said, that's not what he does. Wow. <laughs> what a thing for Paul to say. Because Paul had Christians arrested when he was still Saul of Tarsus. He had Christians arrested and dragged from their homes, kicking and screaming, and thrown in jail, and often killed because they professed Christ. Because before Paul got converted, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, he was dead set against Christianity, and he was persecuting the people that were professing it. I'm sorry, <laughs> the people that believed in it. He was persecuting those people, okay? Then he met the Lord, got his life turned around, and he said, I forget that which is behind. Now, you didn't have folks arrested, had folks dragged out their house, had people killed, and Paul said, I had to let that go. Wow, see, that's radical. Most of the time, what we do is we carry a cloud of guilt and shame over our sins for the rest of our lives. I like the way Bishop Jake said it. Bishop Jake says, you save, but you ain't free. Paul said, that's not what I do. That means in Paul's mind, he was not going over all the people he had killed when he was still Saul. He let that go. He let it go. Okay? So I'm challenging myself, and I'm challenging you, and I'm challenging anybody that's watching me live or anybody that watches this replay. I'm challenging you to do something radical that one of the most successful people in the Bible did. He just said, I forget that which is behind. Wow. Wow. I stopped by to tell you today to forgive yourself. But you say, Prophet Taylor, you don't understand. I lived a really promiscuous life. Forgive yourself. Hey, how you doing? Uh, forgive yourself. But you say, Prophet Taylor, you don't understand because I, I, I stole some people's money. I, I embezzled some funds. But forgive yourself. But Prophet Taylor, you don't understand. I, I, I aborted my child. I, I killed a baby while I was still in my womb. Forgive yourself. 
But Prophet Taylor, you don't you don't understand. I I, I killed somebody. I, I took a, a somebody else's life. I shot him. Forgive yourself. But you say, how can I forgive myself? The same way Paul forgave himself, because you are counting on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. You can't see my arms, but I'm stretching them out like a cross figure. Okay? Because Paul put his trust that the blood of Jesus paid the full cost for his past. If Paul could do that, then we can do it because God is no respect of person. That means if you had an abortion, if you had a really promiscuous life, you slept around a lot, you slept with a whole bunch of people. Maybe you slept with both genders. Maybe you were bisexual. Maybe you slept with men and women. Maybe you stole money. Maybe you were like, maybe you stole petty cash out the lockbox or maybe you embezzled funds. Maybe you cooked the books. Maybe you murdered people. Maybe you took human life. Paul did that. And Paul said, this one thing I do, I forget that which is behind. See, you can only do that. It's hard to forgive yourself in love. That's exactly right. You can only do that more than others. That's exactly right. You are exactly right. It's easier to forgive other people than it is yourself. But you know what the Lord taught me? The Lord taught me that that was pride. What do you mean, Prophet Taylor? Why is that pride? Because the Lord told me point blank. If I have forgiven you, if I have forgiven you, you are contradicting me by not forgiving yourself. Now, I just want you to think about that. <laughs> That's what the Lord taught me. The Lord taught me that if he, if God Almighty, the Holy One, the Holy One that sits on the highest throne in heaven, the creator and redeemer of heaven and earth, if he can forgive my sins, my father, and, and, and allow me to call him father because of Jesus, if he can do that, then who am I not to forgive myself? That's just pride. I was like, wow! <laughs> I was like, wow. Wow. Because the Lord was right and I had to humble myself and I have to continually humble myself when I'm holding my sins against myself. Jesus Christ will come along very gently because he's sweet and meek and lowly in heart, just like he says he is in the scripture. He will come along very gently and remind me that he paid the price for my sin. That's why his death was so brutal. He took the punishment that my sin deserves because in my human conscience, I understand that sin deserves a penalty. But the, 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 the good news, the powerful news, the incredible news is that he paid the penalty. That's why the name of the song is not Mediocre Grace. The name of the song is Amazing Grace because that's amazing. Okay, he should, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, wouldst die for me? So Apostle Paul said, I forget those things which are behind. And I'm challenging myself because remember I told you, I always am working on practicing, going through everything I'm teaching you. I'm always practicing what I'm preaching. I'm not out here saying something that I'm not doing. So I'm challenging myself and I'm challenging you to let's learn how to be like Apostle Paul and have singleness of mind and apply his one thing principle. Apostle Paul said, the one thing I do, and he was successful. Now, if that man was successful and he's telling us what he did, then that means if we do what Paul did, we'll get what Paul got, okay? He said, forgetting which is that which is behind. So it's time to forgive ourselves, not because of anything we, we, that we've done, but because of the shed blood of of Christ, okay? And then it says straining towards that which is ahead. Uh, some versions say reaching, some versions say straining, but the idea is clear. It's this, it's pressing, because in the next verse, Paul says, I press, press towards the mark for the prize. You know what that means? That means that if you're going to go for what God has for you in this life, you've got to go for it all the way. You've got to be 100% to the wall, okay? You can't halfway pursue the will of God for your life. Paul, that is not what Paul did. Paul said, I'm straining. Haven't you ever watched, because uh, uh, I love the Olympics and I love sprints, okay? I love the sprints and I love the baton races. I love them. 
Haven't you ever watched that when the runners are getting close to the finish line, they they reach, they they lean, they put their nose and their face out over in front of their body because just those few little centimeters and millimeters might help them cross the finish line just a tenth of a second faster than their competition. Have you ever noticed that? That's what that means. So, right, somebody's asking me, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Somebody says, how do I press? How do I strain? Here's how. You have to learn how to let the Lord be the Lord of your life in every area. You have to learn how to take a cross to everything that is still self-will directed and turn it over to Jesus and let it become Christ directed. That's how you press. That's how you strain. As long as you are holding on to the reins and the control of your life, you've accepted him as Savior, but you've not accepted him as Lord. You have to let the Lord be the Lord. You have to let the Lord be the judge. And you have to stop being a judge. Because you keep telling yourself you ain't worthy. That's you judging you. Let the Lord be the judge. You keep trying to live a self-will directed life. That's you trying to run your life. Okay? So the way you strain, the way you press, is that you got to let go of your control, your idea, your self-will, and allow Jesus Christ to become the Lord in every area, every thought, every decision, you know what I mean? And a whole lot of people I've discovered, they just have religion, so they don't understand that God has a plan for, like, if you want to go to school, you need to be asking the Lord, what school should I go to? What should, my, what should my major be? And when should I go to school? Maybe you ain't supposed to go to college right out of high school. You ever think about that? Maybe you should wait a while. Maybe if you're going back to school as an adult, you need to ask the Lord, what school you want me to go to? When do you want me to go? Okay? Just everything. When should I have kids? Whom should I marry? At what point in my life should I get married? What level of finances do you want me to be on? On and on and on. You have to ask the Lord about every decision in your life, and you have to be willing to crucify your decision, your choices, your ideas, and let him be the Lord. That's how you strain. That's how you reach for what Christ has for you. Because if you try to do it in your own strength, you try to do it under your own power, you try to do it with your own anything, you're not going to make it. Because we can't do it. Okay? We have to let the Lord be the Lord. That's how we strain. Okay? Okay? All right, uh, so that's our prophetic word for today. There's more I could say on that. I'm going to ask the Lord if I, he wants me to minister some more on that later because there's more in those verses to mine, okay? But I want to encourage those of you that saw me live and those of you that are watching the, the, the video, do the thing that Paul, did, that Paul did. Paul said, I don't do but one thing. Paul said, I'm letting go. I'm forgetting. That means you got to forgive yourself and let your past go. And then you got to reach and the way that you reach is that you've got to give 100% of yourself to the Lord. Just like Olympic-level athletes give 100% of their lives to training, and then they give 100% of their energy to their performance while they're running or doing gymnastics or throwing the javelin or playing their game. You have to give 100% if you want to live, uh, win Olympic gold. You can't win Olympic gold with a half-baked performance. You can't give... 50% and come on with the goal. It doesn't work that way. So to reach and stretch forth to get what you need, you've got to give 100% of yourself to the Lordship of Christ. You've got to give 100% to what the Lord is saying. You can't hold back. Okay? And so that's why so many of us as Christians aren't as successful as, successful as we need to be because we're holding back. Okay? But Paul said, that's not what Paul did. Paul said, I'm letting go of who I was and Paul said, I'm reaching towards who I'm trying to be. Mm, 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 mm. All right. So I'm going to say a quick word of prayer, and then we'll be off for today. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for your matchless word. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit, without whom we can do nothing. We have no wisdom. We have no revelation. We have no insight. Oh, God, just you. So we thank you for, for loving us enough to give us of your wisdom, of your knowledge, of your insight, oh, God. And, God, we want to, from this day forward, we want to apply the principle you taught us today through Apostle Paul's life. We want to forget that which is behind and trust in your blood as payment for our sins. We want to reach God. We want to stretch. We want to learn how to let you be Lord of our lives in every way so we can 
fight a good fight and finish our course and keep the faith and become all that you want us to be in this life. Or so that when we reach the end of our days, we can die with confidence, knowing that we did what we were supposed to do while we lived. So that's quite a challenge, but we believe we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. Amen and amen. Those of you that are coming on now, I'm sorry I have to go now. Um, uh, I have a meeting today I forgot about. So please watch the replay and please like and share. And then uh, I'll be on my regular time next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay? God bless you. Forget those things which are behind and reach for those things which are before. Amen and amen. Have a great week.